all joining us tonight for our debate of our six remaining City Council candidates. I'm Lisa Coombs, your host, and we'll let the candidates introduce themselves momentarily. We're going to go ahead and get started. I have asked Jason Hunter if he would offer a, a prayer, and Daryl McDade is going to lead us in the pledge. Our Father in Heaven, we're grateful that we could gather uh, here today as citizens concerned about uh, our city and uh, our nation. And Father, we ask that if you'd please bless the candidates as they uh, have prepared for tonight, that they might be able to clearly convey what they uh, would have us to know, and that we might be able to uh, learn the First of all, Blaine, uh, thank you for letting me borrow your flag. Don't forget to take it with you on the way out. My name is Daryl Ackerman. Um, I was the immediate past vice chairman of the Utah County Republican Party, so I know a few of you. Um, I'm here out of gratitude. because for the last uh, 10 years before moving to Draper. I lived in Cedar Hills. And uh, we have the privilege of taking advantage of your roads and your fire station and your library and your post office, and I really appreciate that. Um, we've got uh, kind of a packed debate tonight, so I'm going to go over a couple of rules to make sure that it goes uh, quickly and sort of explain the format. First of all, I want to say uh, let's uh, do each other the, uh, the courtesy of refraining from making sounds, comments, noises, and applause during the debate. The reason is because we're going to try uh, to slip in a free-form session at the end, and the more time we lose because we're waiting for applause to die down, the less time we have for that uh, as time goes on. Uh, questions for this debate were selected by your moderator, and they've been uh, locked in a biometrically secure storage device for the last several days to ensure that <laughs> nobody had an opportunity just to sneak a peek at them. I uh, apologize if they're not the most eloquent. I just wrote them down a few hours ago. But I think they'll give our candidates an opportunity to demonstrate their, uh, their moxie on different subjects. Um, the response time for each question is going to be about 90 seconds. The rules say it can be whatever. But it, we're going to try and keep it to 90 seconds so we can get out of here in time to watch uh, um, Nashville tonight. The, uh, the debate will consist of six questions. That will give each candidate the opportunity to be on the hot seat. Um, this keeps it a little bit fair. Yeah, we'll go down the list. We'll sort of start here and just work our way down. Um, each candidate, I'm going to give one minute of what I call flex time. Uh, it's something that we do in professional debate. It's just one minute to extend your remarks if you feel that you need you have more to say, or to respond to something that was said that you really feel motivated to answer. So just candidates, raise your hand, uh, and I'll I'll extend that flex time to you. We have a timer. Uh, where is she? There she is. Uh, she will uh, raise a, a card to let you know or raise her hand. Or, yep, there we go. So for 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and stop. Um, I'm not the most forceful personality, so do me a favor, and when you see the stop, just go and knock it off, because I don't want to have to come over here and get black on you. <laughs> At the end of the debate, we're going to have a 10-minute uh, discussion session on a topic that I have not uh, revealed and a question that I have not written down yet. So we'll just have an opportunity to interact with each other, and then I'll give you uh, the chance to see how they'll work together on the council. I, I hope it doesn't get out of control. So um, that's that. Any other rules that I feel appropriate, because I'm the dictator, and um, well, I'll try to make sure that everybody has equal time to speak. So we're going to begin with introductions. Um, we're going to start with, now everybody's going to have a minute and a half just to introduce yourselves, and we will start with uh, Sid Lamont. Well, first, welcome and thank you for coming tonight. Is this on? Is it you guys hear me? It's red. red. That's red. 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 We go. We got it. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, welcome, thank you, and um, for coming tonight, and thank you for Daryl for, for hosting, and for Lisa, and for doTERRA for providing this facility for us to meet, and they did this at no charge. We really appreciate their contributions to our community. A little bit about myself, I'm a lifelong resident here in Pleasant Grove, and attended our local schools, um, moved on to Utah Valley University, where I received a bachelor's degree in business management, and worked in financial aid there for about 12 years. And Working in financial aid really gave me the opportunity to help students achieve their higher education goals, and higher education is something that's very important to me and uh, to my family. 
and achieving those goals was no easy task. My husband and I uh, went to school full time and I worked full time in the financial aid department and we were able to get our college tuition paid for at no cost. So I'm grateful that we had the opportunity to, to go to school debt free and that was something that's very important to me. Um, I've been serving on the city council since January 2012 and have gained a lot of experience and knowledge from from serving for the last four years. I've served on multiple boards and committees in the city, including the library board, uh, the rec center, police, uh, public works. I've also served on the Heritage Jubilee. I've served in our local schools, uh, in the PTA. I'm, I'm very involved in, in, our, in our local schools. I'm also currently serving, I was nominated and am serving as Mayor Pro Tem, and that means when the mayor's gone, I get a fill-in in his absence, and that's been um, really, really fun to be able to step into his shoes. and. Uh, the last, uh, it was actually a couple meetings ago, I had a young girl come up to me after and she said, has there ever been a female mayor? And I said, no, but if you keep staying involved, maybe you could be the first female mayor in Pleasant Grove. So I thought that was neat that she recognized that, um, that, we, that we need that in our community and, and just recognize the, the differences and, and the way that she can be involved. So thank you. Okay, Don. Last time they said they couldn't hear my voice. Do you hear me okay? Back. Good. Uh, my name is Don Paz. I am I'm running for city council um, because I, I had a very good career. I'm thankful for everything. I started out as a, as a young man, um, very patriotic, went off, uh, volunteered for Vietnam, went and served a tour of duty in Vietnam. Before I went there, I met my wife and uh, we uh, recorded by letter didn't have the modern communication to have then. I got engaged by proxy with my stepfather and um, got married as soon as I got back home. That's been 43 years. And so um, we, we have been given a lot. I've worked my whole life in the, the aerospace industry, taking care of contracts for the defense of our nation, ranging in cost from $10,000 up to millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. And I've been very successful at that. And I've decided that, you know, it's time for me to give back some. I'm retired now. I have the time to give back. I've been um, successful in managing these contracts. Uh, and I think I can be successful in working with our city and our city council to manage our contracts there. Thank you. Lynn. Hi, I'm Lynn Walker, and it seems like we were just here just a little while ago. And what you see with Lynn Walker is what you get. Uh, we'll put on no airs. We'll give it a good shot to try to get to know all of you better, but I'm really pleased to see that I know probably two-thirds of this audience and have some good interaction with, with the good majority of it. We've lived here uh, the most of our lives and raised our family here and have really enjoyed it. You know, as I left to go chase work uh, throughout the Western United States, we've had the opportunity to work in aid of the Western United States. And we've done that all our lives and, and done some massive big jobs and had a lot of work and done it successfully on time, in budget, and I covered all of those things. Everything that we need to do in PG City, I've had the opportunity to do before. Uh, I would like to see that, that we get moving on two or three things that we need to get going on within the city, and we need to do that soon, uh, because it costs you money the more you delay it. Thank you. Blaine Thatcher. I'm Blaine Thatcher. Um, I've lived here in, in Pleasant Grove for 23 years. Uh, I've raised uh, my family here and very much enjoy living in Pleasant Grove. Um, I have an accounting degree from Brigham Young University and uh, for the last 30 years have, have worked in the accounting industry. Uh, currently I have my own accounting practice and uh, provide managerial accounting for small businesses and uh, help them uh, design and develop accounting systems to uh, help them make wise management decisions. Um, this is something I never thought I would be doing, um, but uh, being an accountant, I, uh, 
realized uh, a while back that uh, I didn't know the financial situ situation or status uh, of our city. And so I began uh, looking into the financial statements of the city to understand what's really going on. And the deeper I looked, the more concerned I got. And, uh, you know, we, we have a few issues that need to be dealt with. And so I decided that I need to do something about it and decided to run for city council. Eric Jensen. I'm Eric Jensen. I'm glad they have the name tags this time. We, so we don't have to introduce ourselves every time. Um, my wife and I have raised our kids here in Pleasant Grove, longtime resident, 24 years, and thoroughly enjoyed it and what Pleasant Grove brings to, to us and our family. I come from a small business background uh, in the 90s where I ran a company where I traveled around not only the states but the, uh, worldwide helping people set up their IT infrastructure and their business models. I enjoyed that before I went to work for the city of Warren. Uh, with, with Pleasant Grove City, I've, I've had the opportunity to not only be involved with the Downtown Advisory Board, but also the Starbury Days Association and the Planning Commission and also the Chair. And this last week I had the opportunity to join with the City Council and work with that. And it's been a joy to, to work with the citizens of this community and, and get involved with them on all fronts of our community. Thank you. And finally, Matt Godsey. So I'm Matt Godsey. Um, I have a bachelor's in civil engineering and I have a master's in structural engineering. Uh, before, the previous location where I worked was down at a company in Provo on a large scale community development project. And so I have a lot of background in the, the overall community development. And then where I'm working currently is at Mountain State Steel down in Linden. I'm a senior project manager. and currently manage large scale steel building and bridge projects across the 11 western states. What I'm most proud of is that I'm married with uh, six kids, uh, three girls and three boys, and they range from 11 to 1, so every two years, and it's, it's pretty hectic, but it's, it's just like managing everything else. And one of the reasons I'm running for city council is I want to make sure that the great amenities that we have, the, the library, the parks, the rec center, all these things are around for my kids when, when they are older and when they're starting to have their families up there. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> So um, we're going to start at the end of the table here, um, now that you've, you know, everyone's kind of warmed up. Uh, and the first question for each of you is, in your opinion, what is the most pressing policy issue facing Pleasant Grove, and how do you plan to address it? Okay, Let's start with you, Sid. What's the most pressing, uh, in your opinion, the most pressing policy issue facing Pleasant Grove, and how do you plan to address it? Sid? You know, based on what citizens have told us right now, their their number one priority is is the roads. Uh, I would say matched with that would be the public safety building. And those are two issues that when I ran four years ago did not come up in the debates. They were not issues until about 2013 when our city council had the guts to start tackling the, the, the big issues that face our city and the ones that are going to cost us money to repair. And we really started tackling those, and that's why you've heard so much about them in the past two years, is because we're, we're taking, I guess, high road, no pun intended, and we're really trying to resolve these issues. And it's going to take some time. It's not going to happen overnight, and that's why you've seen it take since 2013 to get where we are. We have a citizens committee that's now reviewing the past research for the public safety building. We have a, a road plan. It's actually going to be coming a three-year road plan in the middle of this month from our new public boards director. We had a 10-year road plan based on citizens and feedback. We felt that we needed to shorten that and get these roads going as quickly as possible. And that will be coming in, like I said, in the middle of the month. And so we're moving forward on these issues. We're making progress in Pleasant Grove, and I'm excited for, for the future here in our city. And I'm excited to be part of the progress and make this a better, better community for our children and grandchildren and really lead them in good hands with making sure that the policies we make, the ordinances we set, uh, the legislative decisions that we make are ones that, that they'll be able to, to appreciate and have pride in, as well as our current community and citizens. Okay, Don. Thank you. I'm excited about what I've learned. I'm gonna stay on the same theme of the roads. There, there's three big issues I'm concerned about. Um, the roads, the public safety building, and the uh, the, the secondary water issues and stuff. So let's go with, with the roads. I, I really think, in looking at the numbers, I've gone out to some other cities too and I've talked to them. I said, what could we do 
and how much could we do it for to get our roads in good shape? That's my question to me. And so I've gone out there and I've come up with some numbers and stuff of how we can raise the money without increasing the taxes. And I was questioned on that over the past, which rightfully should be done. But I was successful in going out and talking to some cities that have reduced the cost by 30%. I was hoping for 20% in my numbers, but they reduced it by 30% in how they did their roads. Um, and the coating of the roads, I, I thought that was the most exciting thing I learned, is we can coat these roads and stop them from getting too much worse here because we can't do them all at the same time. Only $32,000 to coat a mile of roads and keep it lasting. So I'm excited about the prospects, excited about working with the city. I brought the things up in the past and uh, on some of my ideas, but. You, you kind of have to have that vote in order to get your project going. Thank you. Lynn. Everybody uh, here, I think, realizes that we, we have some pretty poor roads. And the reason that we have those poor roads is that we haven't been able to get the revenue to keep up with those roads. Having served as your public works director for 14 years and just recently retiring, I can tell you that from first-hand experience, that you have not had enough money to even patch the roads, let alone fix them. And painting them will do in some cases, but not very many of them. Uh, you have got a uh, $100 million liability out there, and everybody's warned me not to say anything. But you know you can say that, that $100 million, we've got to come up with part of that. And who pays the bills around here? Me and you. Who's paying for all this? Who's going to pay for these roads? In one way or another, you guys are paying for those roads. And I'm right there with you. So let's do it the best way we can. Let's, let's get out and let's find what funding we can find. And there is some out there. And you're being asked uh, by the county to vote on some that could produce, produce you $374,000. And, uh, well, I won't throw that in right now. But the, uh, uh, the thing is, we've got, to, we've got to get after these roads. Every month you let those go, you've got another month's wear on them. And every month's wear is going to cost you more to repair it. So the longer you put it off, the more expensive it becomes, and you better get started on them. And that's one of the half a dozen reasons I'm going to Okay. Uh, Blaine. Um, I'm going to say our number one most pressing issue is spending. We have a spending problem in Pleasant Grove, and it's uh, most significantly manifested in what has been discussed here, the roads. Uh, the roads problem is a very big problem. Uh, it is the largest dollar problem we have to deal with in Pleasant Grove. And the reason it is as big a problem as it is, is because of our spending problem. Year after year, we've been able to find uh, dollars to increase spending in every other department except roads. And that's why we're in the trouble we are with roads. Uh, we just have not allocated the dollars to it. Um, we have a slow growth revenue stream in Pleasant Grove, and it is adequate to provide the needs uh, we have in the city, but you have to be able to control your spending to be able to allocate those dollars reasonably to the important needs that we have. Roads is clearly our highest priority need now. And even after identifying that this year as a council, our current budget was approved that didn't allocate any more money to roads, but continued the spending in other departments, increases in spending in other departments. All right, Eric. Thank you. I think you're probably going to hear from all of us that it's roads, and as we heard, spending. Um, I've, sit up, I've sat on the council now for about uh, four, four and a half months. And I've sat down and I've talked to Dean about our roads. We know that we have 40% of our roads that are labeled as fair to poor condition. Those roads just didn't happen overnight. The, the, the can has been kicked down the road for far too long. 
and like has been discussed before, we're taking it on as a city council and discussing it and trying to find the money for our roads. As discussed and heard, we're going to go line by line. Well, I've got those line by line items here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, and if you want to see them, I'll show you afterwards. And you can make the call where you'd like to see those cuts made because it's going to come down to people, wages, insurance. That's a hard decision for us to make. And, that, and we've heard that that's not going to happen. Taxes are not going to be raised. People are not going to be let go. Well, show me. It's time to show me. Because I've got the list, and let's see it. Thanks. And Matt? The last comprehensive survey that I know of that was done was in 2012 by the city. And in that survey, roads were one of the top priorities in there. Since that time, something has come to light, and that's a public safety bill. The study that was done previously on that was older, and we just had a recent study done that basically shows that we have some public safety buildings that are in dire need of repair. So the pressing issues, I think roads and public safety buildings are there, but at the same time, why are we at the point where we're at? I believe it's because of the monetary spending and the fiscal responsibility of, of the city of where we, over the past 10 years, maybe 20 years, it, it has been a long time. So we're, what's the number of priority? It really is. What do we have to do within our current budget to be able to fix the problems? I don't see a catch-all. I don't see that there's an economic plan that can bring in all the money that we're going to be able to fix the problems in our city, even over the next 35 years. I don't think we're going to have enough money to be able to cover those things. So with that, we need to go and look at the budget where it is. And I appreciate other council members' standpoint on this, but I've done it with other companies and things like that. You can go in with a zero-based budgeting system and say, hey, this is what we have to spend, and say, make sure your budget works within that means, and it does get a lot better. Okay, thank you very much. So. Uh, you guys are noticing I'm being a little bit flexible on, on time. Uh, I am timing the overages, but you know we're we're ahead of time right now, so we're just going to kind of be casual and, and chill about this. Second question: So estimates from recent studies suggest that the city is facing close to an 88 million dollar bill for road upgrades in the coming years. Are these estimates accurate? And if so, how do you plan to address this challenge when you are or return to the council? Let's start with Don. Great. Oh boy, my chance. Um, I actually went through the same thing, and uh, I, I, I agree with that number. It might be, you know, ten million dollars one way or the other, but it depends on how much you want done on them as well. And so I also, uh, I, I went knocking on doors all over, and, and I talked to some people, and you know, they lived just penny to penny, and they they were concerned because they heard the utilities were going to go up again, and. They said, I've got $61 to last me the next, the next two weeks of the month. And, and so we've got to remember when we make decisions on taxing people here in this city that there's some of us on fixed income. I'm retired on a fixed income. Uh, you know, I know that there's taxes going on everywhere. The cost of food's going up. Everything's going up. But I've looked on and basically we've got the money coming in. We're paying off a bond that's going to bring us about $740,000 in. We're going to bring, there's other revenues coming in. We already pay a million dollars. So I talked to these other cities and I said, how, how can I bring the cost down? They said, they brought theirs down 30% by doing the work themselves there. And I thought, well, why don't we get with some of the other cities next to us too and see if maybe we can do that. So I just want to bring ideas to the council. Then we'll talk about them. We'll work it. And as a, before we come and ask for another penny, I want to make sure that you know every penny you paid has been taken care of. Thank you. Excellent. Lynn? Uh, the $100 million figure can be bounced up and down 20, 30 million in either direction. Uh, as you need to decide as a public how far you want to go with these roads. You also need to decide as a public what you're going, what we would like to do with these roads uh, as far as would you like to get your curb and gutter in the sidewalk that's missing to the tune of uh, about $19 million plus the whole bunch of sidewalk that needs to be repaired to the city. But there are several ways to to handle this. The, you can come up with about uh, 1.8 million, as I remember, to go towards the roads, and you need about 4 million to get it done in 20 years. Uh, those are just kind of rounded off figures. 
you're going to have to take a look and see where you can get the funding from and see where, where you can best utilize it uh, and how you, how you put this thing together. You can stretch it out maybe three years and still work it within the plan. You can, there are a lot of things you can do, but I am of the opinion that you're going to want to pay as you go and that you're going to want to establish a fee uh, that would make up that other $2 million. And that's a fee that you could be adjustable by the year. Thank you. Um, the way to deal with this, uh, in my opinion, is we have to control spending. Um, we are currently the almost leading the county in the the high level of our utility fees. We, we are a high cost uh, producer of city services. Our administrative load in our city is among the highest, uh, as a percentage of revenue, among the highest of cities in the county. The cost, overall, the cost of providing services in Pleasant Grove has nearly doubled in 10 years. When you realize that in those same 10 years, cumulative inflation has been less than 20%, population is some growth in those 10 years is about 10%, 15%, excuse me. Um, I'm having trouble justifying, and I haven't been able to get anybody in the city to be able to justify those rates of increase. So the way I think you have to deal with this problem is you have to control spending. And we need to embrace the concept of being the low cost provider of city services rather than a high cost provider of city services. Okay, Eric. Like I said, we, we have about 40% of our roads are in bad condition. We know roughly 80 to $100 million. Where is that going to come from our $12 million budget that we keep hearing about? Where is it going to come? We look at the spending. We try to be frugal in everything we do. The departments have been uh, living on the same operational budget for years now. But we say we can still cut. Sure, well, I guess we could look into that and look into it more as a city council. There was a JUB study done, and it gave us some estimates. Two million, four million, six million, eight million. What it's going to take over a 20-year period, 14-year period, 12-year period to, to pay our roads off. How do we want our roads to be? Okay. Lynn said it. It's up to us. We have to choose what level of service we want our roads in. And then we have to move forward with that. And then we have to find that money. By 2018, we can have an estimated amount of about $1.7 to $1.8 million coming into the city after we free up all our Class C road money. That is a start for us. And we can look at that. But where do we find the other $2 million plus? And that's up to us as a city council and citizens with your vote. And that. For me, there's two parts to this equation, not just one. One major part of this equation is forward thinking and looking down the road on how to get there, how we got here in the first place, and trying to prevent those problems from happening farther down the road in the future. Not, no pun intended. So the uh, secondary water system went in 2008. And we went in and we cut these lines in almost every single road in Pleasant Grove, essentially degrading the lifespan of that road because you have these surface penetration points that can go in there. On top of that, for every dollar you spend in road maintenance, it's approximately 10 to $15 of money saved in the future. So we gotta be looking at this on a broad scale. We're down, down in the future, as well as currently how we're gonna find the money. Make sure that we are doing the things that we have to do now. Let's do the overlay plan. Let's make sure that if we, if we have to fix the pipes underneath the road, which is a huge dollar value that we haven't even discussed yet, and on top of the 88 million, that we are addressing those issues and fixing the roads on top of those concurrently. Otherwise, what you're going to do is you're going to fix the road and find out you have to fix the pipe. You're going to rip the road right back up and you're going to have the same issue that you're going to have, that we already have. Now, with the money that we're going to find, there is money available. I don't think that we can go and look for just the easy route. It is going to be difficult. But we need to scrimp and we need to save and we need to reallocate certain portions of our fund into roads because in the large scale, that's how we're going to reduce this money. And Sid. 
we don't have a spending problem, we have a revenue problem. And my plan is to increase revenue and do what's called grow the grove. And that's the area right off the freeway by, uh, by the exit. That's going to be our revenue and our future for Pleasant Grove for 20, 30, 50 years. Right now, the estimates have come back that if we build out the Grove, we're looking at $4 million annually a year. That is huge for our city, and that's definitely going to help contribute to the cost. It's a win-win for the citizens and the city with revenue and giving them a place to shop, eat, for entertainment, when we can bring businesses to keep our dollars here in the city. I haven't heard several of my opponents mention one time about economic development. Not one time. That's where we can fix our roads. That's where we can solve a lot of problems in the city is by increasing economic development and bringing, that re and bringing in that revenue. I don't believe in bonding for the roads. We are going to be receiving an additional $750,000 in 2018. It's not a spending problem, it's a revenue problem. Right now we have extremely low interest rates because we manage our budget so well. We run a balanced budget. We are an award-winning city for transparency and the way we manage our budget. We're paying down our debt. We have a revenue stream to pay off every debt that we owe. And it's not a spending problem. As far as utility rates in the, in the county, comparing us to some of the other cities actually isn't apples to apples. This Orem does not have secondary water. How can you compare our utility rates to a city that doesn't even have secondary water? They actually are, are off culinary. So I'm not sure how, how, you, can, how you can do that. Um, so I think we're actually doing pretty well as a city, and I'd like to see proof that, that we have a spending problem um, when I've heard otherwise. Okay. So, uh, this third question, and we'll start with uh, you this time, Lynn. In the middle of town, there sits an old workshop that served for years as the town's fire station. Some have suggested that it's time for an upgrade. Do you agree, and if so, how do you plan to fund such a project? To tear down the old fire station? Um, Is that what I'm hearing? I just said that uh, some have suggested that it's time for an upgrade. So whether that means replacing it or retrofitting it, or uh, do you agree? And if so, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I, I'm uh, one that likes to see things utilized to the best of our ability. Uh, I'm also one that likes to hang on to history, but I'm also one that's a realist. And I live in a house that was built in 1874, and that thing's cost me millions <laughs> to try to keep the thing even livable. So I think you need to look at this in, in real value and, and sit down on it and say, what do we do with this? But I am not one that wants to get rid of every historical thing in the city by any means. But I do think you've got to... You've got to evaluate what it's going to cost you to try to retrofit it, what it's going to, what it's going to do to the city. And here again, citizens, what do you want? You're the one that's paying all this money. If I'm going to go spend extra dollars on retrofitting that thing, it's coming out of your pocket. And no, there isn't, there isn't money laying around that you can just go grab. Okay, Blaine. Um, if millions have been put into his home, I'm, I'm a little concerned. I think we're going to have to re-audit the financial statements and find out what we're paying these people. <laughs> I'm joking. Okay. I'm joking. Um, the, the fire station um, is, is old. It obviously has needs. Uh, we, we have maintained all along through the last couple of years that, uh, that we have significant needs. Uh, in our public safety facilities. Um, the trouble I have with, with the course we've been on here is we were told very significantly over the last year, particularly uh, in the last bond debate, that upgrading really wasn't an option, that it was way too expensive, and that we had to build new, and so we only looked at that option. And what was proposed was a very expensive option. Um, and most of the citizens agreed it was way too expensive. Uh, we now have information from an engineering study that was done uh, on the fire station specifically, as well as a few other buildings, that apparently uh, that wasn't true. We can uh, renovate that building for a much more reasonable cost. So uh, the city has put together a public safety building committee. I think this is a very good approach. Let the citizens uh, vet 
other options, look at all of the reasonable options, and, and make a recommendation to the city as to what approach is most cost effective for the citizens. Okay, Eric. Um, so the question was, retrofitting or new? If you go walk through the fire station, I think everyone should agree that retrofitting is not the answer this time on our fire station. We as a city council commission, a group called Bowling Collins, they go out and look at that. And they came back, and that cost, and I'll leave it up to you if you decide it's a good number or not, it was about $3.2 million to retrofit that building. You decide if that is an appropriate number to retrofit or time to build new for our fire, firefighters there. It's that simple. When you look at that study, there's concerns there with that building and what they've been dealing with over and over. And so we need to really take a look at what our committee is, is doing, understand where they're coming from and what they recommend to us, but they also have the study before them also. So I agree with the Bowens and Collins study. It's, it's very well done. What I did find from there is that um, there's four different buildings that were assessed and they're all over $200 per square foot for a retrofit option. If we look at RS means, RS means is the national guideline for cost per square foot, it's cost per square foot guidebook. And for public safety buildings, and we're talking about just the building, not all the furniture and everything else inside, the average across the nation is about $170 per square foot. So I think it's very reasonable for us as a city to pursue the option of a new building was to be fully functional and at a lower cost in retrofitting, even lower than what the previous bond proposal was. As far as how to pay for it, I really do believe that the majority of the citizens will back a well-proposed bond initiative to pay for the public safety building as long as those costs are reasonable. So the study came back from Rollins and Collins, as has been reported, and 3.2 million, as Eric said, just to retrofit. That's the same looking building, that's the shell, that's not furniture and fixtures, which add an additional 20% usually onto the cost. That's also having to relocate community development. That's no additional uh, anything within the structure. That's $3.2 million just to retrofit. And I, I, want to, I want something long term, I want something that our community can be proud of, that we don't have to turn around in 10 years and have our children now fix the problem that we didn't do right the first time. I think we owe it to our children in the community to make sure that we do this right, we do a quality project, and we make sure that we provide safe and efficient facilities for not only our firemen, but also the police as well. And if we need to do it in phases, then we do it in phases. But we make sure that we're doing a quality project. Uh, I, when the numbers came back, I was, I was surprised that they were actually that high. Because to me, to retrofit a building and basically get a few things changed on the inside to bring it up to code, that's what that number is, to bring it up seismic and ADA accessible and meet the codes, was $3.2 million. So I am in favor of moving forward with the solution. Just because it got voted down doesn't mean the need went away. We still need to find a solution for our first responders that the community will support. And I know with our new Citizens Committee and the past research that's been done, that we're on the road to doing that. So I'm, I'm excited for the progress that we're making. Um, this has been a long road for our city, and I think we're, we're on the track to getting there. And Don. Thank you. Um, for the record, I think we need a either a good fix on that safety building and I don't think it's worth putting two million dollars into a house so my position would be we need to have a new safety building public safety building I would do it differently though this is how I'd approach it first of all I haven't seen and I've tried to get the city I, I work as a program manager I lay out major programs starting with the uh, manufacturing the engineering and I laid it out on a Microsoft project thing and so I would have never spent three times the, uh, and hundreds of thousands of dollars for all these different studies to say we need a new fire department I would have gone to the people said we need a new fire we hire some good top-notch people we have engineers we've got good business managers that work in our city you know, I'd like to see them just come out to us and say, hey, this is, this is what we need. First step, do we need a new, fire, a new public safety building? Yes, we do. Second step, go to the people, tell them what we need, how much it would cost, where would the fundings come from. I would go after the funding a little bit different, though. I, I try to find and meet people halfway. And we've got a lot of property, some houses to sell, we've got some land. I would try to sell some of that and come to the people and say, we can raise $2 million of the $10 million, whatever those numbers are. And, and we really need, before we go any further, we need a buy-in. And that's how I'd approach any business deal, and that's how I'd approach this one. Thank you. Um, 
Lynn, there have been a couple of jokes at your expense uh, regarding the retrofitting of your home. Would you like to well, yeah, it's a nice home. <laughs> could, I, uh, could I speak to that? <laughs> I overreacted a little because in the middle of that, I realized that he wasn't talking about the old, uh, the old fire station, which I refer to as the old fire station on Main Street. And uh, so I've got a whole different outlook. But uh, yeah, it wasn't millions, but it was double what the things were. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so tonight we sit in a gorgeous facility that's in the heart of what promises to be a thriving economic center here in Pleasant Grove. Do you support future development of this area? And if so, what impact do you imagine such development will have on the city's finances? Let's start with Blaine. Well, um, future development, I think, is, uh, is a positive. Um, it was mentioned before that uh, some candidates don't believe in economic development here, and that, of course, is not true. Um, I believe very strongly in economic development. The trouble with looking at economic development as the panacea for our revenue problems, and consequently our spending problems, is that the study, the study that the city did themselves in 2012 shows that the $4 million that you generate in building out all of the Grove area takes 35 years to have happen. And that the growth rates in our spending, and mind you, that's without increasing spending in roads, okay, that's the growth rates in spending in other departments in 35 years, we will so far outpace that $4 million gained that you then have no benefit from the economic development. So to kind of correct uh, what was mentioned before, uh, we have to solve the spending problem. We also want to provide economic, economic development. And I think the best way to do that is to be the low cost producer of city services to have a low tax base, which is sustainable, businesses will want to come and develop here if we maintain a low tax base. Okay, Eric. Isn't it exciting that we can sit in a building that's part of economic growth? Isn't it exciting to look out when we, when we uh, leave this facility to see two other businesses that Billy Taylor has brought in? Isn't it exciting to see holiday oil, other businesses that are springing up they're coming out of town, they're excited to come because we're bringing revenue into our city. Now, will revenue solve the problem? No, but it can help our city with some of the, some of the taxes that we're looking at as a city, right, that we, that we discuss. So economic development, when we talk about that, our future is great. The future is looking very bright for Pleasant Grove, and I'm excited for it, and to be one of the ambassadors to help bring in that business. Thanks. Okay, Matt. I definitely support economic growth. Um, we recently hired a, the city recently hired an economic development specialist, who I think is going to help us get down that road a lot faster than when the, what we've previously been doing. So I applaud that effort. The numbers that we have heard is, is $4 million, and I believe that the same number is, is somewhat accurate. You know, it can flux a little bit depending on calming and everything else. One of the numbers that's staggering to me is that the population growth in that same 35 years is anticipated to be about 10,000. So our maximum growth in Pleasant Grove is 45,000. We're currently around 35,000 residents. Our current cost of providing service as a percentage of the budget is about $850 per person. If you take that number out to the 10,000 people, that's $8.5 million over the next 35 years for those additional 10,000 residents. Let's just say it's half that number. Let's say we have $4 million. That $4 million in additional revenue for <coughs> the entire Grove area will cover just the additional increase in residents based off the numbers that I'm finding. So I don't see it as a solution. I see definitely go for it. Let's do everything we can. Let's push for it. But as others have stated, we need to find other ways to be able to take care of our current budget so we can continue to grow in Pleasant Grove. I support, I'm a huge supporter of local business. I, I promote and support it. I'm a huge uh, 
of advocate of bringing in new development and working with developers down in the Grove area because that is the future of our city. We actually have over 600 acres that are still down there that are waiting to be built out. As well, I'm, I'm also in favor and have moved to uh, make motions in city council to reduce multifamily housing, make sure that every square inch that we have left in that Grove area is zoned for commercial and retail only. And we actually just discussed that in the past few months. As well, back in 2012, I was one of the council members that put a moratorium on high density housing to reduce it from 32 units an acre down to 12 units an acre. And since that time, we have seen a reduction in the multifamily housing. What we need to do is set the stage for future development. And by doing that, making sure every piece of that Grove area is for retail and commercial is what we need. We have a 20 acre development coming in this month for office and retail. The hotel is still on the table. We have the void coming in. We have, the growth is happening. Um, in fact, sales tax revenue from 2014 outpaced the previous historical high, reaching 20 in, in 2008. Uh, building permit revenues, residential and commercial, increased over 70% in the fiscal year 2013. So we're making huge progress. People are coming here. People want to make their homes here, and we need to do everything we can to bring in that revenue, keep our tax dollars here, and keep our community spending their money here in our city. And I wish I could hear more, more positive comments about that other than everything we're doing wrong, everything that's going wrong with the roads. I want to focus on the positive things and how we can make growth here in Pleasant Grove happen. Okay, so, we're, we're, that doesn't count for that, me that, that was my dad, so I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's, for the record, it was mentioned that I haven't said anything about economic development. I talk economic development all the time as I go out to cottage feeding, as I go places. So I just want that on on the record. And also to show you, I'm, I'm interested and involved in that. I sit on the uh, the newly formed city's committee as an ambassador, and I've gone out to some of the businesses. I've gone out to other businesses outside that are looking to move and been talking to them about coming here. So I am for economic development. But we're talking about how this money's going to come in. This is a beautiful place. It's 20 years without paying taxes. So even if we get, if we continue growing like that, and we give these breaks where they don't pay taxes, and, and I'm not disputing that, I probably would have done the same thing. Remember, that money doesn't come in right away. Now, it's important that we bring the businesses, but I, I tried years ago to get them to bring uh, a Sam's Club in here and, and stuff. So I, I have been working on that. I want to see the same development. I applaud the effort of the city in trying to get out there and develop. I think I think this is an area where they shine and they've done good. And I I want to just be there with them and help continue doing good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Lynn. I, uh, I agreed uh, with Sid that, that we do need to be more positive about things. I think the city's actually doing a darn good job and with, with what they're doing. It's just you're developing a lot of things that are coming to a head that have been let go that you've got to finance. I, I again, don't think that, that the economic development is the total answer. I think mean, you're still going to have to be going back to, to other funding sources. But uh, yes, we've got to have that, and we've got to have it quick, and we've got to have it right. And we need to we need to get after it and, and hang right with it. And appreciate uh, Sid and the, and the council when they put the moratorium on the idea. But the uh, the big thing is is we need to keep moving forward, not backward. Excellent. So, next question. The debate so far in this campaign, and I don't mean on the stage, but outside, has been spirited and at times intense. What do you consider to be the citizen's role in such debates, and how do you imagine, as, as a city council man or woman, you, sh uh, you should interact with the public when elected? And we'll start with Eric. First and foremost, our, our role always, and every Tuesday when we meet, and, and every day when we meet with citizens, is to listen. Listen to their concerns, understand where they're coming from, their background, where they live, and especially the issues that are important to them at the time. Roads may not be important to them. It may be economic development. It may be the public safety building. The key factor is listening to them, understanding where they're coming from, and then moving forward, and under, especially understanding to them and letting them know that that's important to us and that we can do something about that. Yeah, 
I agree that there's been a lot of uh, more heated debate, more more interest in, in politics and more interest in the city. And I think part of the main reason, I, really the main reason for that, in my opinion, is because we're talking about high dollars. The public safety building, the roads, the pipes underneath, those are not small things. These are really high dollar values that affect every single citizen of Pleasant Grove. So I do agree that it's the council member's job to listen to the citizens to see what they need, what they want, what their concerns are. If we are not able as a city field to provide the essential services for the city at a reasonable cost, we will not have citizens that want to come to our city and want to remain in our city. So I think it's very important that we listen to citizens, but at the same time, we have a fiscally responsible budget and outlook to be able to make sure that we can make this place a wonderful place to live, not only now, but in the future for all of our children. Sid. Well, the good news, as I mentioned before, is that this is the first council in many years to address the tough issues, and that's why I think many more people are getting involved, because we're finally, we finally have the guts to tackle them. A council member's role is first to be listening to the citizens, as Eric said, and to be a legislative body in the city. We make policy, we make ordinances, we, we make the tough decisions every Tuesday night that affect you and your family on a day-to-day -day basis and for the future. The next role of a city council person is, for me, community involvement. And unfortunately, I've been criticized for being too involved. And as being on an activities committee or whatnot, to me, it's not an activities committee. It's supporting the community and the people that elected you to serve. You know, last Friday night, um, several of the candidates had a, a meeting scheduled during the homecoming football game. Maybe that's not a big deal to you, but it is to me. Three of us were at that, at that game, as were much of the community supporting the players, the high school, the parents. Shows where the priorities are for the people, the elected officials. I want to support PG players, our youth, our athletics, our programs in the city. And the only way I can better serve you and show up on Tuesday night and make decisions on your behalf is by spending time with you out in the community. That's how I really get to know you and hear your ideas and your concerns and your suggestions on how to make our city better. I take that information back with me and make my decision on Tuesday night as part of my decision-making process. So it is critical that we are involved with the community and I communicate with the residents on a daily basis, whether that's at the grocery store, through social media, over the phone, over the email. I'm communicating every day with you and that's my job to be your council member 24-7 during the time that I'm elected. Okay, Don. Okay, maybe I heard the question just a little bit different. Uh, our spirited debates and, uh, and our interaction with the public. So I want to go on record tonight here that, uh, first of all, to tell you that there's been a lot of dirt out there. And, um, and you know, in the military, and I, I fought in combat, you lay down a smoke screen to hide, hide the enemy's ability to see what's going on. And, and there's been some smoke screens laid down. And I want, you know, I think the interaction is that we ought to be honest, upright people. And I want to go on record that I do not agree with any of that, wherever it comes from, any side. I think it's beneath our dignity. My gosh, we're Pleasant Grove citizens. We're Americans. We fight together. We die together. And when I came back from Vietnam, it hurt when people hated me. And I haven't recovered from that. And I want you to know, I'm hurting now, too. Lynn. Thank you, John. Uh, I think the first thing we need to do is, is understand the citizen. We need, to, we need to get your ideas. We've got to be able to listen to you. We've got to be able to take what you tell us to heart. You elect these five people whoever you're going to elect to speak for you. And if you don't want them speaking for you, you better go see them and tell them what you want. And I think that's, our, that's the big thing we need to do. Uh, the next thing I think we need to do is to be, to be honest and to be very forthright. I hate the word transparent. There's no reason. You know, what is transparency? And transparency is different to you and to you and to you and to me. Let's just be honest. Let's be just straightforward and, and get things done. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to think about PG, uh, good old Pleasant Grove, as it was, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And let's put the Pleasant back in that Pleasant Grove. It's a great city. 
And you are great people and great citizens. And you should never be afraid to voice your opinion. But you ought to be able to do it honestly and within reason. Of course. Um, you know, I think it really goes without saying that the citizens have the critical role uh, here in our city. Uh, elected representatives are just that, elected to represent those citizens. I find it interesting that everyone on the stand here clearly states the obvious. However, as I've been participating in city council meetings over the last year, and as I've watched the debate and the interaction uh, between citizens and our elected officials and our administration, I've noted a couple of interesting things. Um, it's actually been stated on public record by a sitting council member that they were elected to represent the employees of the city. I've also heard from each of the three candidates that are backed by the city that their top priority is to take care of and represent the employees of the city. So I'm trying to square that with what is the obvious role of the elected official uh, to represent the citizens first. And I think we all try to do that, but something's falling short in, in our recent history. Wait, guys sitting here, we cough. Uh, in the interest of fairness, I'm going to ask if any of the current city council members would like to take a minute of their flex time to address that charge. If not... I, I don't... That would be my one minute, that's it. Yeah. I... No, I, I'd rather move on. Okay. I'll wait till the end. Okay. I just wanted to... <laughs> okay. Uh, last, last formal question. So we're all conservatives here, and we each in our own way have felt the sting of federal overreach, particularly in the form of burdensome taxes and how to control debt. Now I'm going to go out on a limb and just assume that you know, we're all being vice, former vice chair of the Republican Party. I assume everybody in Utah County is Republican. Sorry. Um, please explain how your presumably conservative values will shape the decisions that you make with regard to the spending and revenue needs of the city. Let's start with Matt. That, that is a really good question. I appreciate that. Um, I, I think that comes down to what we have as core values and our constitutional understanding. Um, we have certain inalienable rights as Americans, and those inalienable rights need to be upheld at all levels of government, at the state level and at the local level. There are property rights. There are um, freedom of speech rights. There's right to bear arms. Those things all need to be upheld and ratified by our local government here in Pleasant Grove as well. There are a lot of things done on a national government level that I do not agree with, particularly pertaining to taxes. Taxes, in my opinion, should be taken only as needed and not for anything else other than to provide the essential services of the country, the defense of the nation, the, the health and wealth, welfare of, of the people, which that does come down to the local level at Pleasant Grove as well. We need to be providing the essential services for the citizens of Pleasant Grove. And only those things do we need have to, to provide from the taxes. If there are other things that the citizens are willing to go on and pay tax for above and beyond that, I'll support that. But we have to provide those essential services first. Okay, Sid? Again, this goes back to economic growth. We need to increase our revenue. We need to look at our current budget and make sure that, that we're running efficiently, and I can tell you that we are. Let me give you some examples of how we've been running lean. Um, there are capital projects that every year we, we push back because we don't have the funding. Um, we have one man taking care of 140 buildings and structures in the city because we don't, we're not able to hire someone else right now. 
Uh, fire department was not, was not allowed to increase the budget um, at all this year and increases place there to cover benefit costs and employee wages. Um, we have some of the lowest paid employees, especially in our fire department right now. Um, the fire department, again, going back to them, they needed a brush truck and they couldn't afford a new one, so they built it themselves for $100,000 less. Um, we are, in, as far as our parks and recreation, we have, uh, if, it's, if the program's not working, it, it does get cut. As well, um, they try and do simple things like buying things at the lowest price when, it, when, when they're on set. I mean, that's just a simple thing, but showing that we are taking it seriously and trying to manage the budget and save wherever we can. I just saw, served on the Heritage Jubilee Committee, and we could have spent taxpayer um, money in, in full force, and instead we went out and got donations. And doTERRA was actually one of the biggest donators to that, to that event, and we appreciate that to help our community. The local business has also stepped up. As well, something that the rec center is doing is they have uh, redone, again, a small thing, but makes a big difference in the end, is they have adjusted their time cards to make sure they are accounting for employee time and making sure that everyone is uh, is, is putting in the, the time required for their programs and adjusting for that, that accounting practice. So we are doing things every day to run lean, and, and, and it's a good thing we are. And so I, I would say continue to run lean, continue to be conservative, and save money and increase revenue. Okay, Don. Back to government <laughs> overreach again then. So I... I've served in countries and I've seen nations fall because the government controlled everything. So my position on it and the way I would use it is I would never, never think of putting a tax in place without the public knowing why and, and in advance being able to participate in it. And I would never put a tax in place that didn't have an end to it. I think that ought to be our federal government too. If you write a tax in law, you have a dead date on it too. I know they do some, but they never seem to hit them. So my involvement would be to, to keep America free by letting the people always be involved in the decision making. The way that I do that is come out to you, reach out to you with specifics. Uh, I see a letter that comes out and tells all the great things we're doing in the city, and I love that I read that each week as it comes out. But I think I would do one that covered the political things that are being discussed too. So you know in advance that we're you know, talking about metering secondary water or we're talking about a public safety building. And so communication out to the people is good. Now I'm sad to say that probably only 20% of the people really get involved, but that's the way of life. But at least everybody ought to have the opportunity. I fought for that. Men died in my arms for that. And that's how I would managed from a government standpoint. Okay, Lynn? We're consistently, uh, I've, I've noticed through my tenure with the city that, that they have consistently uh, done things to cut and, and bring back and be tight with, such as leverage bids at the time of the year, uh, save thousands, such as lining and getting the money so that you can expend the money at the right time to be able to make money with your expenditures such as your sewer in the city currently. You've saved not hundreds of thousands, but here's that figure, if you like, millions on your sewer. And your sewer's in pretty good shape because you moved on it 14 years ago. Don't keep kicking the can down the road. Force these guys that you put on the council to make things happen. And yes, we're always going to find the cheapest, most economical way we can do it. And that's what you should expect out of this group. And if you're not getting it, then you need to vote them out. Just that simple. There are always ways to make things cheaper. There are always ways to make things better. And we can, we'll seek those out. You, you just, you make them seek them out. They do it anyway. They do a great job with it. City's being better run than you're giving it credit for. Okay, Blaine. Uh, yeah, I think this is a, an interesting question. We hear a lot about conservative uh, nature, conservative values here, and um, I think we have to look a little bit at the track record to, to test what is claimed as conservative uh, principles, conservative decision making. Um, I think our political spectrum right here in Pleasant Grove is probably fairly similar to what we see on the national level. The difference is 
that we all claim to be conservatives here. We have the same liberal conservative spectrum. And as I look at the decisions being made, you know, it has been mentioned that, that there is a lot of good going on in the city, and, and that's true. That's why I live here. I love this place. It's a great place, and there is a lot of good being done. But the track record of the decisions is certainly not conservative. We're spending on a pace that is actually not sustainable. Even if we get all the economic development we can, our cost of providing services has doubled, in, almost doubled in 10 years. We're a high cost provider of utilities. Our administrative costs are among the highest in the county. Our city tax level is 72% higher than Spanish Fork, which is very, very similar to Pleasant Grove in population and demographics. The decisions and the path we're on don't seem to represent the conservative values that I believe in. Um, okay. Eric, so, I definitely don't want to follow your national rule of thumb. I think Pleasant Grove can be a trendsetter here. I'm not sure why our employees, for some reason, always take a hit from our city. I get weekly emails from our employees that it shows how they're cutting costs on a weekly basis and what they're trying to do and their goals. And we look at the budgets every year and we see that their operational budgets, again, have not really increased. They take pride in that. Our employees take pride in what they're doing for our city and what they can save for our city. Now, when we look at spending, we keep hearing this word tonight that the city's overspending and spending. Well, I, last, last debate, I asked you to come meet with me or Dean Mundell. Now, Dean has left our city, and we have to look to a new financial director. But you can still come meet with me and go over the budget, and I can show you, and you can look at the budget and see if there's truly a, a overspending on that. And again, why my line I've heard Again, show me where that, those cuts are, because I'll show you the people that you're going to be cutting in the city that provide the great services to the city. Revenues, economic development is what drives the city. Small businesses, take a drive down our, our Main Street and see the tremendous work that has happened there. I'm excited about it. All right. So we are right on time. I'm going to go ahead and open it up to a... Uh, a free-form discussion. This is going to be time-bound. We've got 10 minutes. And um, I just want to give each of you the opportunity to interact with each other and, uh, and go a little bit deep. And I'll be honest, um, before this debate, uh, to do my homework, I called up each one of these candidates and I had about a half-hour discussion with them. And I'll tell you, they all go pretty deep. So this is a little bit scary, but I also think it'll be very uh, educational for us. So what I want to talk about is uh, just the state of the current budget. And this can go pretty much wherever you folks want to take it. Um, you know, my understanding as a layman from Draper is that uh, we have an annual budget of about $12.8 million here. We have this $88 to $100 million worth of roads situation we have to deal with, the public safety building. There are a whole lot of challenges, lots of things we need to take into account, potential $4.something million worth of additional revenue for developing this area. Um, you know, folks have talked about opportunities to cut. Folks have said there aren't opportunities to cut. So let's sort of open it up as if this really is uh, the city council and talk about the budget and whether the budget as it sits right now is sustainable. So I'll, I'll go ahead and start if that's okay. Um, several of the candidates have spoken about administrative costs and, and, and cutting those. We can magically find $1.9 million in our administrative costs. Let me tell you what's included in those admin costs that we'd be cutting out. Park staffing, computer technology, PG Chamber of Commerce, police radios, reverse E9, E911 system, recreation staffing, cemetery staffing, library staffing, court transcriber, lockbox, city planner, parks employee, fire staffing, liability insurance, streets and park staffing, uh, police officer dispatch, uh, these aren't 100% in that department but is a portion of these administrative costs that go into that. It also includes our city attorney, our city finance director, our city manager. If you're okay with cutting those, um, I'm not. I'm looking, I want to look at the budget as a whole. 
and I don't want to be so narrow-minded that all we do is look at cutting costs that are going to take away from the quality of service that you and your family enjoy. So I'd like to hear what the other candidates plan to do and, and what their idea is for, for I, I'm not for necessarily cutting all those services that, that you and your family that are essential to the city as well that you and your family have come to expect and enjoy in our city. Well, sure, go ahead, please. Um, you know, it's an interesting take. Um, I still ask the question, why have those costs, all of those that you just spoke about, mm -hmm. why have all of those nearly doubled in 10 years? Cumulative inflation is less than 20%. How come we have that much? Do we have doubled services? We have we more have, population, that's for sure, and we also have an increase in revenue. No, it's 15% population growth. Well, I'd like to growth. see where you're getting your numbers. Okay, well, call, what number do you want? All of them. I'd like to, because I'm referencing mine well, straight from the city but, budget right here. But, but it, our growth in the cost of providing services, the, the, the administrative type services okay. you're talking about, has increased dramatically. So do you expect way no beyond growth? Way beyond... The, the rate of inflation, way beyond population growth. How do you justify that? Where are you getting your numbers? Out of the financials. Hmm. Our, can you show that? I can. I've shown charts. Oh. You sat in meetings with me about these. Okay. I, I, well, I've actually seen your charts, and <clears throat> I'll go back to the meeting that I had with the mayor. Answer the question said. first, actually. Well, revenues have increased. It costs money to run a city. It costs the money I understand, but why does it cost so much more than other cities, times. and why does it cost... Why is it increased so dramatically? Okay, let's uh, give the city. I'd like to see us zero this back in now, um, because I, I think it's going to your point, our point, but we're really a city council here tonight. Mm -hmm. So we need to talk about what we can do. You know, I'm looking at the same number she's looking at, and of course, if we cut out every one of them, then we get rid of all those people, and we're not talking about doing all that, are we? Aren't we talking about coming up with some money that we need for the roads? No, we, ta we talked about. Okay, sorry. We talked about the fact that. We, we've got an issue here where we need to come up with some more funds. So how can we as a city council come up with some more funds and, and at least before we go back to the citizens, convince the citizens out here that we've looked at every opportunity to find some money and do that. And of course we don't want to cut our fire. You know, we need all these people, but you know, we've got some great people that we've hired now and promoted that are, are leading our city. Good engineers, good business managers. Can we cut some in our... Uh, and, and the different things where we go out and subcontract? Is there any place where we can maybe keep the legal stuff in our city? And not what? I don't know, you guys. I, I'm looking to you to bring this together so that we can do the best we can do. What could we do? Eric, I also want you to chime in on this, but let's go over to Matt real quick. I, I just have a couple suggestions on that. Um, one is I know that the city is currently looking at potentially hiring another engineer to come in so we can reduce the amount of money that we're outsourcing in engineering services. I think that's a wonderful study that needs to be done, and I think it should be done on the legal side of it too. And when any time we're putting money outsourced to a, a separate company outside of the city, those are areas that we can cut the budget without cutting any of our personal our personnel or the, who our, our current staff is. And there's a potential for savings there. Does it work out? Is there money there? I don't know the answer to that, if there is or not, but I definitely believe that we should look into that. Why not shop these out? Unlike the like when you were contracting out for roads or some other services, we have to bid those out, those processes out. <coughs> These legal services and the engineering services, I don't, from my understanding, I don't think we're doing it the same way. We don't have to bid those out for services, but we should cost those out and see what other options we have. Can we go with a different engineer? Can we go to a different legal department? To, to do that, or can we bring some of that in-house? Eric, you said you looked at some of these line items. What's your take? Sure, and it's the same thing that was shared, that Sid shared, and that's why I keep saying it's showing it line by line, but you keep saying that the costs have increased. Well, you go back to 2010, and then I've heard this discussed about enterprise funds, our, uh, our fees that we see monthly. Well, in 2010, and, and Lynn can attest to this, they, they were in trouble, right? Or, and secondary water, sewer, and, and water, main water, they were in trouble. So do we just let them fail? No. The current city council at that time took a hard decision and increased the rates so they could be proactive. So we talk about increases, that's helping our city, right? Are we going to let our sewer system fail? Are we going to let our water system fail? No. Well, the state mandates that that cannot happen. So we talk about increased pr uh, prices, yes, because we're trying to be proactive and get to the point where we can pay as we go. 
We look at these line items here, and we're talking about people's lives here. We're talking about the level of services here to people. It's not just that easy to say that we can go in and do these certain things. Don't you think that other city councils have looked at this? Staff has looked at this. We have. We've looked at it. And we're always encouraged to continue to look at it and look at our costs and find ways to save money. So, yes. Lynn, we haven't heard from you yet. I want to give you a chance. I would uh, be glad to point out. The, uh, uh, one thing we want to all keep in mind is these things change city to city all the time. And you need to be careful, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Eric, that Orem just went out for $185 million to take care of their infrastructure underneath the roads that they've already fixed. Is that correct? That's correct, because they, they don't have the secondary system that we can, do. Can but, your yeah. city help it if they're way ahead, and even a city so great as Orem? Because they are. They've made the decisions at the right time. They've done things at the right time. They've spent the money at the right time, with the exception of the roads, and we can get into a whole other discussion on that. Is that the discussion we're in? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm in, I'm in on the roads. Well, I, I'm just asking what I think is a relatively simple question. Uh, we keep hearing from several that there is nothing we can cut without cutting services. I'm not saying that. And we never said that. Well, uh, I'm sure you... <laughs> We can't cut it. If we're going to cut something, we're cutting services. That's right. So if, if you're making that assumption, help me understand why the cost of providing services has increased so much in a 10-year period when inflation has been less than 20%, but our cost of providing services has increased 87%. Our population has only grown about 15%, but our cost of providing services has increased 87%. I don't see the correlation to say if it's increased that much, if we cut dollar one, we're cutting service. That's, that's incongruous. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. If we've grown that much beyond the cost of inflation, uh, there's got to be things that we can cut. We seem to be able to say we, we don't have any money to allocate to roads. So help me understand. That's, I think it's a simple question. You want detail specifics. Give me some detail specifics. Why is it the cost has grown so dramatically and I haven't been able to get an answer from anybody from the city uh, or our council on that. Are you no, but, but if you look at the population numbers published in the audited financial statements of the city in the last 10 years, we're somewhere in that 15% population growth range. So you don't expect any any revenues, any anything, any operations to grow? Are you you're not looking forward to growth in ten years? I'm not I'm not sure what you're saying. Like you don't expect the city to grow within ten years? Well, let me try and explain it again. <laughs> it's a, I think a fairly simple question. The cost of services has increased almost eighty seven percent. It's actually over eighty seven percent. About revenues. Okay, I'm talking about the cost of providing services. You're saying if we cut a dollar of service we're cutting services. But right. our, our cost of providing services has increased so far beyond our population growth, so far beyond our the rate of inflation. Um, I, I'm failing to understand, and I can't see anybody giving me a justification for why the cost of providing these services in Pleasant Grove has to grow that much faster than inflation, that much faster than other cities. I, I, need, I would need to do some research because I, I don't know where your numbers are coming from. Like if you can show me in the budget, if you can show me, and okay. what I can, no, let me finish, please, is I take some time in council meeting, and you know, I don't know all the answers off the top of my head, but that's my job is to find out. It's to go and it's to research the information from our staff, from the citizens, and to give that information. Well, you've had plenty of time to figure this one so out. So have you. Blaine. You've had plenty. Well, yeah, believe and, it or not, and, and, and that's my point. Believe it or not, we're at time. Full time fire department. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> so, so I think I think we've had a taste there of um, of what city council meetings would be like. <laughs> 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 
borderline boring. Yeah. yeah. Can I quickly just? I looked up on Wikipedia. I don't know if yeah, it's a visual If you want to go ahead and burn it, go for it. Yeah. Well, that's fine. I'll use it for the purpose of the population in 2000 was 23,000. The population in 2010 is 33,000. Estimated population of Pleasant Grove in 2014 is 37,000. We pick that. We're over 37,000 now. I think we're good. So, um, you know, I was, uh, it's I was really hoping that we would have time for, 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 for that discussion, first of all, but then um, for everybody to, to give sort of a closing remark. And we do. And then after that, I think we're going to have time for some one-on-one -on -one afterwards. So we're, this was great. And, uh, you know, um, now I'll, I'll go ahead and let you guys speak first. So let's start on the end here and then work our way down. Sid, do you want to go ahead and wrap it up? So what can you say about that? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, you, have a, you have a minute and a half, but then some of you have an extra minute to burn. So, yeah, let's, let's go for it. What I hear from particularly uh, one, of my, one of my opponents is constant criticism and no ideas. And I, I have yet to hear what their plan is. To, to fix anything. It's just constant criticism of the city. I want to hear ideas. I want to hear progress. I want to hear moving forward. That's my plan. I want to increase revenue. I want to make this a better city. And I, I don't hear that. I just hear negative and, and what we're doing wrong. And, and I've heard the word trouble multiple times. And I've heard that's interesting. And I've heard smokescreen. I've heard all these different things. And I want to, I want to hear progress. I want to hear what's important and how we can fix it and make it better. Not about cutting everything to where there is nothing left in our community. That's not why I'm here. That's not why I'm running again. I want to make progress and not just maintain but make it better. And I don't want to just focus on roads. There's a huge picture here in Pleasant Grove. And what I've heard from, from several candidates, and not just tonight, but at another meeting, was they want to cap spending in all departments. They want to look at using volunteers to help maintain our parks. And they want to uh, cut and scrub the budget. I, I, want, to, I want to improve. I want to I want to make progress in our city, and and I don't believe that right now, um, from the from the some some of the things I heard that that we can make progress to doing that. My plan is to move forward in a with a positive attitude, with an optimistic attitude, and look at everything we can to bring business in, to make sure you and your family have a secure future here and a safe future. Make sure we take care of our employees. Make sure we take care of our residents, and do everything we can to make this a better Pleasant Grove in a positive way. I think we're done with the negativity. And as Lynn said, let's put the pleasant back in Pleasant Grove and let's make this a better future for our families. Great. Don? Well, I hope I haven't come across negative because I sure don't think negative. My wife and I, are, we love Pleasant Grove, we love life. I've never met a man I didn't like and, um, and stuff. But that doesn't stop me from being a business manager. And a business manager says that you bring people together and you solve problems. If you like it, that's what I'll do. I've done it before. I brought Israel and France together. They weren't getting along with country, with companies within our country like Boeing and Lockheed. And I've been able to work with them, bring them together, solve the differences, and time for them to build weapon systems that protected them from enemy attacks. I will continue to do that. I will do that whether elected or not. But if I'm elected, I at least get a vote in saying how we can work and say, what can we get? What can we get? before we have to go back and do that. I love my country. I want you to know that I think that Pleasant Grove citizens are the best in the world. That's why we live here, too. My kids live here. Um, I think the world of these people. This man here is one of, the, one of my heroes. I'd say when I get to be as old as him, I'd like to be just like him. I think I passed him up. And so everybody I work with, you know, I really enjoy working. I, I just want you as informed, to be informed citizens, so that you don't go out and vote for me based on my popularity. Oh, I lost my wife's vote right there. Um, <laughs> but vote for the people that are going to work to make the city happen and function. You don't need 30 more seconds. I'm done. <laughs> okay, Lynn. Thank you. I said something like that. I know, and I'm saying nice. <laughs> the, uh, the thing I, I would like to close on is, is simply this. I've watched and been here the majority of my lifetime, Linda and I. I've watched a lot of people 
field seats in the council and mayorships. I've watched them work hard. I've watched them work their hearts out to get us to the point that we are in this city. And I am not willing to start giving up services because everything you cut will cost you service. This city runs more efficiently than you're giving them credit for. For Pete's sake, and as you start seeing, I'm not doing that. As you start seeing things, things go forward, you will see other cities fall right into the same thing. And we have moved before the council, and we've made the decision. And your council has worked hard for it. I love watching Sid, because she is to everything. I don't know how she does it. I love watching all of these people and the work they're putting into this campaign. I wish it were a little more clean, but so be it. Uh, and that's how I want to call it. Point. You know, I think you can see from what we've heard from each of us tonight that uh, there's really a very clear choice in this election. Um, there are three candidates uh, who believe we can't fix our roads and meet our needs without raising taxes. And there are three candidates here who believe we can meet our needs and fix our roads without raising taxes. And that is a very clear choice. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm one of those three who believe we can do this without raising taxes. You know, our population here in Pleasant Grove, I think, is a tax-averse population. They feel they're overtaxed as it is. And why is that? It's a general sentiment around the country, but it's clearly apparent here. We have people on fixed incomes, they can't afford major and significant tax increases. Our citizens need evidence that their tax dollars are being spent wisely and that they can be allocated to all of the major needs in the city. And when we see that our utilities are next to the highest in the county, our administrative services are among the highest in the county, our tax, our city tax level is 72% higher than a city like Spanish Fork. The cost of providing services has nearly doubled in 10 years. This is not the type of evidence that the citizens are looking for. Now, this is where I think there's a tremendous opportunity here in Pleasant Grove. This election represents a huge opportunity to change the paradigm, to make the shift from being the high cost producer of city services to setting the goal to be the low cost producer of city services. The division that we have in our city right now, I think, will disappear very quickly when we can show the citizens of Pleasant Grove that we are a low cost producer of city services. That is the tremendous opportunity that we have here in Pleasant Grove. I'll take my extra minute. I, I docked you for 30 seconds, but if you just keep going. <laughs> this is our opportunity here in this election to make this change. It's going to take leadership. Currently, I don't see the leadership necessary to make the spending choices, to actually do the work to look at our spending problems, <coughs> and help us become the low-cost producer of city services. I have looked through the financial statements. I have worked with numerous organizations who have embraced this philosophy, who have created this corporate culture to say, we are the low-cost producer. It produces such dividends, it creates immense morale. Blame. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be, but that's the minute. Okay. So I, that's the change we can make here in Pleasant Grove, and I ask for your vote. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Eric? Yeah, thank you. I've always, in any cause that I've been involved with, I believe in being fair, 
cost and dedicated to that cause. My cause that I'm involved with now is the city. I've always enjoyed working with the city, citizens and employees of the city, because they care about our community. You talk about the role of a city council person, you hear infrastructure, roads, sewer, water, underneath. And then you hear about public safety, that's the core. But there's so much more to our city than that, to our community. Rec department, parks, library, public works, and the list can go on. I want to be fully invested with the city, because that's what it takes to run a city, is to be fully invested. We have revenues that come into the city, and we try to spend them wisely. We have departments that are looking after their budgets wisely, that report to us, that ask and show us look what we're doing to save money for the city. And it's much appreciated. We've been accused of being individuals, of raising taxes. That's not true. Anytime any kind of tax is going to be levied to any citizen, it's going to be your choice, your vote, after the facts are presented to you. I take offense when I hear we're backed by the city. I'm backed by the city. Well, I hope so. That's the citizens. That's what I look to for my support. I love this community. I love what it's about. That's why we moved here, and that's why we stay here in Pleasant Grove. We can't compare ourselves to other cities, apples to apples. It's just not that way, especially on the enterprise funds. We have to compare ourselves to people that are going into the TSSD, and then you'll soon find that we're not at the top of that list, that we're actually in the middle of that list and doing quite well in providing those services to our citizens. We're looking out for the citizens and just trying to pay as we go. We get criticized for that. I don't know why. I love this city, and that's why I'm running. I ask for your vote. Thank you. Yeah. My kids use the rec center for basketball and frequent the library programs that are in there. We go to the pool. We go to the parks. And we participate in the senior living portions of our city. We love our services here in Pleasant Grove. However, I do not see how we can continue to offer those services with our current financial trends. For that, I do offer a plan. And that plan is, let's look at our budget as a zero-based budget. Spend the time to determine the essential costs in each department of our budget. Go through, line by line, figure out what we absolutely <coughs> have to have. And then from there, we can continue on and look at what else we can offer. Do not just transfer the budget from one year to the next because that's what we've done in years past. The city's needs change. Just like a single family in an apartment, as they grow, their needs and their budget changes. And once they become mature and go and retire, their budgetary and their needs change as well. Our city is in a different place than we were two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. We need to be reanalyzing our budget on an annual basis from what we absolutely have to be, have to provide the services and continue from there. I urge each of you to vote for those who have the education, skills, experience, and ability to solve the multi-million dollar road <coughs> and subservice infrastructure problem that we have in the city. This is not going to go away. I ask for your vote. So real quick, uh, just to wrap this up, um, I moved here 2002 from back east. I grew up in Columbia, Maryland. I was born in D.C. And uh, when they suggested that I move to Utah, the first thing I did was I did a little bit of research on um, who you people have been voting for. I saw names like Hatch and um, back then, I think, uh, uh, Cannon and stuff like that. I looked at their records and I thought, wow, I want to be around people who not only have candidates like that to choose from, but are smart enough to make the right choices. I don't envy you this choice tonight, because I'll tell you, I'm looking at six people that I would be proud to have represent me. I think that you've got uh, a really difficult uh, kind of a difficult challenge in front of you, uh, and I think you should really consider expanding the size of the council. <laughs> With that, I wanted to uh, thank our candidates, thank all of you for coming out, and uh, I, hope, I hope this has been informative, enjoyable. Let's give the candidates a round of applause.
outside, and we've got about 25 minutes to do some. Uh, we would like to thank Daryl for taking some time out of his busy schedule to come and be our moderator this evening, and we've got him a delicious cupcake from one of our very own local oh, yeah. businesses. Yeah. 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 is Eric Jensen's birthday, and he couldn't think of a better place to be. Thank you again for coming, and please meet our candidates at Malawi.